Young and in love. That is the phrase that perfectly describes Mitchell Weiser and Benita Bickwit. Mitchell was 16 years old and Benita, or Bonnie for short, was 15 years old. Both lived in Brooklyn, New York and attended John Dewey High School. Both came from stable, middle-class Jewish families. Even though they were young, they were quite committed to each other, even exchanging playful wedding rings and referred to themselves as husband and wife. In late July of 1973, Mitchell and Bonnie were planning on going to a summer music festival. The Summer Jam Festival that would be held in Watkins Glen, New York, would include acts such as the Allman Brothers and the Grateful Dead. This festival was huge with over 400,000 attendees. It once received the Guinness Book of World Records entry for largest audience at a pop festival, surprisingly bigger than Woodstock, which was four years earlier. At this time in their life, Mitchell was working at a photography studio in Brooklyn, New York, and Bonnie was working at a summer camp, Camp Wellmet, in Narrowsburg, New York. Quite a distance between the two places of work. Originally, when it came to this concert, Mitchell was going to go with a good friend of his named Larry. Now, Larry's mother had a bad feeling about this festival. There were a few different reasons. One, they were young. It was also going to be far away. There was going to be a lot of people there. She did not want either of them to go, but obviously she was not Mitchell's mother, so she had no control over Mitchell, but she didn't want Larry to go, so Larry could not go. So Mitchell decided to ask Bonnie, his girlfriend, if she wanted to go, and she was all for it. Mitchell's mother didn't want him to go either, but on July 26th, he left the home to hop on a bus to Narrowsburg, New York to meet Bonnie at Camp Wellmet with only $25 in his pocket. When it came to Bonnie's parents, they were actually at this time vacationing in Cape Cod and they had no idea of their daughter's plans to go to this music festival. Mitchell arrived to Camp Wellmet around midnight. He took a cab from town where the bus dropped him off. He phoned his sister and told her that he had spent the entire $25 just getting up there. She told him that if they didn't have enough money to make their way to the concert, they shouldn't go, but he refused to miss out on such an event. After Mitchell arrived, Bonnie asked if she could take off from work. They said no, so Bonnie quit. According to Bonnie's sister, this was something that had been coming for a while. Bonnie was unhappy working there for a bit of time. She felt like she was overworked. She felt like she wasn't making enough money. So this was kind of the last straw for Bonnie when they didn't give her permission to go to this music festival. So she just decided to up and quit right then and there. So Mitchell and Bonnie, two teenagers with basically not a lot of money at all. I'm not entirely sure how much money Bonnie had on her because she had been working, but apparently they had very little money and the next morning after breakfast, they decided to hitchhike. Bonnie made a huge sign telling passerbys that their destination was Watkins Glen, New York, and they were planning on standing on the main road to the camp to try to flag down someone to drive them to the concert or as far as the person was willing to take them. All they had was their backpacks, sleeping bags, and each other. Bonnie told friends that she would be back on Monday to collect her last check and her belongings, and Mitchell's family expected him back on Monday somewhere later on in the day. But they never made it back Monday because they never made it back at all. A few days later, Bonnie's parents arrived back home. Bonnie's father received a call Tuesday asking if Bonnie was home. Her parents were quite confused, thinking that she had been at camp this entire time. They immediately traveled to the summer camp where Bonnie was working, and they reported Bonnie and Mitchell's disappearance to the local police in Narrowsburg. This was the 70s though. It was a different time. A time where two lovers running away wasn't uncommon, and that's what the police believe happened to Mitchell and Bonnie. As their families claimed, the police at the time acted as if the two were simply some hippie kids who got too high and ran away to San Francisco. Even though both Mitchell and Bonnie's families knew that they would never do such a thing, police figured the two would be back eventually. A few days later, Bonnie's parents received a letter from Bonnie. This letter was written three days before Bonnie and Mitchell left the camp. In this letter, Bonnie talks about her independence and does allude to travels and hoping her mother would be okay with it if that's something she decided to do. After Bonnie's parents read this letter, they kind of talked it over a little bit and they figured that both Bonnie and Mitchell took this summer to travel around a little bit and have their independence and that they would both be back by the time school started. This is kind of what both Bonnie and Mitchell's families thought because there was just no way 
that these two teenagers who were both very responsible and valued their education extremely would miss school. So they figured they would be back at the end of the summer. The end of the summer came, school started, and Bonnie and Mitchell were still not home, and their families knew that something was incredibly wrong, but police at this time were still considering them runaways. Their families knew better though. Bonnie and Mitchell were very bright, good grades, popular, had everything going for them. They were both extremely close to their families and had so many friends. They were also insanely responsible. Running away would be out of their character. Their families really received very little help from police, so they decided to reach out to the FBI. They wrote letters to the President of the United States, even went to psychics. The FBI and President never got back to them, and psychics gave them completely different answers every time. One claiming Bonnie and Mitchell might be in California. They tried everything they could, but none of this helped in the search. About a year later, their families heard of a theory that ultimately sent shivers down their spines. They heard about a serial killer who targeted individuals in the Adirondacks around the exact time Mitchell and Bonnie went missing. His name was Richard Garrow. He was captured on August 9th of 1973 and sentenced to 25 years in prison, but was shot dead by a corrections officer in 1978 after he tried escaping from prison. There is no proof or solid evidence he had any connection to the disappearance of Mitchell and Bonnie. I do have to point out though that where they were going for the concert was Watkins Glen, which is right here on the map, and the Adirondacks is around this area. It isn't impossible they were two of his victims, but it does seem a bit far. This is a theory, though, that I do have to mention. As time went on, more theories and information surfaced. They managed to speak to the first person to pick up the two on their journey to the festival, which was a truck driver. I personally could not find much information about this truck driver, but he claimed he dropped them off somewhere off State Route 97 which doesn't really narrow it down much because 97 is about 70 miles long, but since they got on in Narrowsburg, then it would be somewhere between here and here, somewhere in this 40 mile distance they were dropped off. They were supposedly last seen by the truck driver on the side of State Route 97 with their sign trying to flag down another individual to drive them closer to the concert. I could not find much information on this truck driver. I could not even find out his name. Apparently, he was not really considered a suspect, which is a little bit surprising to me because he is the last known person to have seen them, but apparently he was quite helpful to police and they didn't consider him a possible suspect. We do not know what happened next or if they ever made it to the concert at all. I did read that they were supposed to meet up with some friends when they got to the concert, but of course cell phones were not a thing back then, so they couldn't just really call somebody up and meet up somewhere, but no one there had claimed to see them, which there's a lot of people at that festival, so it would have been almost impossible to find them in the crowd anyway, and it isn't like you can interview every single person there if they remember seeing them or not, so it's just a tricky situation. So let's get into a little bit of the mindset of Bonnie and Mitchell before they left for this summer music festival. Apparently both of them were quite on ease before leaving. It was later found out that the week before they left for this festival, Bonnie actually snuck home and her parents didn't see her because they were away, but neighbors saw her and her parents didn't know why she had snuck home, but after looking around to see if anything was missing, they realized that the $80 that Bonnie was saving up for a new bike was missing, so apparently she snuck back home for that money. So if Bonnie went back and took this $80 and went back up to summer camp, she would have most likely had at least a little bit of it left before the festival, if not all of it. I don't really see what she could have bought up at summer camp or what she would have needed $80 for. So her and Mitchell may have had more money on them when they left for the festival, which is a little strange. If they did have more money on them, why they would decide to hitchhike. Maybe they were just trying to save more money for the festival. This is completely unknown. Police did talk to friends at the camp and they said that Bonnie would cry on occasion about her father because he was disabled and quite ill at the time. This was something that always kind of was in the back of her mind, it seemed. This of course is not out of the ordinary. A young girl who is close to her father would be concerned for him if his health was failing him. That would give her more reason to stick around though. Why would someone worried about a loved one just up and leave? In one interview with the New York Times, Bonnie's mother talks about her and her daughter's differences saying, 
Bonnie and I really didn't communicate too well. When your viewpoints differ, you just don't want to argue. I wasn't too happy about her wearing jeans and polo shirts and going without a bra. I never knew the depths of her feelings. Also that summer, Bonnie's best friend was overseas in Europe, but Bonnie and her were writing back and forth to each other. Her best friend claimed, yes, Bonnie had some issues going on, but she seemed overall fine. Bonnie did not express in the letters at all that she had any desire to run away. As for Mitchell, the only real concern he expressed to others was that he thought he might not be able to go to the college of his choice the following year. He wanted to go to an out-of-town college, but his parents just didn't have enough money. This mystery would consume their family's thoughts for the rest of their lives. Bonnie's family never moved from their family home, hoping that one day Bonnie would come back. Mitchell's family did end up moving to Arizona, but it was for health reasons. They did find out that even if they move, they would be able to put their new Arizona number in the Brooklyn phone book, and that's what they did for many years to come. And 13 years after Mitchell and Bonnie's disappearance, Mitchell's father received a strange phone call. His father answers the phone, and the operator tells him he has a collect call from Bonnie and asks him if he wants to accept the charges. Mitchell's father was thrilled and says, yes, yes, of course. And then the operator comes back and says, I'm sorry, but she hung up. Everyone always hoped that it was really her who called. This case was completely still until 1998, the 25th anniversary of the Summer Jam concert, when Eric Greenberg, a reporter for the Jewish Week newspaper, started looking into the case. He grew up in Brooklyn as well and was very familiar with the story of the two teenagers who disappeared in 1973 on their way to the famous music festival. He found some very interesting information at the Sullivan County Sheriff's Department. He discovered that police lost a lot of notes, files, didn't interview a lot of crucial people that they should have, and they also lost Mitchell and Bonnie's dental records that could have been used to identify them one day. The police on the case back then just didn't seem to take this case too seriously because, like I said, they thought they were just runaways. Now, after much effort from family and friends, the case was finally reopened in the year 2000 after Mitchell's graduating class held a memorial for the two. This is also the same year that a supposed eyewitness came forward claiming that he knew exactly what happened to Mitchell and Bonnie back in 1973. I'm going to read the insert straight from MitchellandBonnie.com. In 2000, a witness, Alan Smith, claimed he saw both Bickwit and Weiser drown while they were on their way back from Watkins Glen. Smith, then 24, said he was also going to the Watkins Glen Rock Festival and hitched a ride on a Volkswagen bus, and two teenagers, whom he identified as Bickwit and Weiser, were also on the bus. He did not know their names, but had heard them talking about the girls' summer camp and recalled their clothing. They all stopped to cool off in a nearby river when Bickwit got into trouble in the water. Weiser jumped in to save her and they were both swept away, still alive. The bus driver told Smith he would call the police at the nearest gas station, but authorities have no record of such a call being made. Police call Smith credible, but wonder why, as an athletic Navy veteran, he did not try to rescue the drowning teenagers. They are investigating his account, which has not been confirmed. The driver of the bus has not been found, and Smith cannot remember the location of the river the teens allegedly drowned in. As a result, his story cannot be fully investigated. With every single case in the entire world since the beginning of time, there are always people who come forward with false information. and. A lot of people think that that's the case with Alan Smith's story for a few different reasons, but the main reason is that he completely refused to take a lie detector test. So we don't know if his story is true or false, and even if he did take a lie detector test, we still don't know, but the fact that he refused in the first place makes his story look a little fishy. This case remains open. They do have detectives monitoring the case on and off. And as of right now, Bonnie and Mitchell have been missing for 45 years. Bonita Biquit was 15 years old at the time of her disappearance, brown hair, brown eyes, four feet, 11 inches tall, and weighed around 90 pounds. Mitchell Weiser was 16 years old at the time of his disappearance, brown hair, hazel eyes, five feet, seven inches, and around 140 pounds. Both were wearing blue jeans and t-shirts. Mitchell wore gold-rimmed glasses, and his hair was parted down the middle into a ponytail. 
If you have any information regarding their disappearance, you are urged to call the Sullivan County Police Department at 845-794-7100. You can stay anonymous. I will include all information and sources that I used down below in the description. Definitely go check it out. I will also include the MSNBC segment on this case. I would highly recommend watching it. It's a two-parter. It's on YouTube and it has a lot of interviews with family and friends. So if you're interested in this case, definitely go give that a look. Their family and friends deserve some sort of closure in some way, even four and a half decades later. And I hope that can eventually happen. This is the part of the video where I kind of share some personal thoughts, some thoughts and concerns that many of you may have, just a little bit of a chit chat. Now when it comes to this case, there are a lot of theories out there, a lot that I didn't really mention because I don't think that they're super plausible. There's one theory that maybe when they were waiting for the next person to hitchhike with, they went into the woods to use the bathroom and they fell off of a cliff. There is another theory that they made it to the festival and they took some drugs and they forgot who they were and lived the rest of their lives up in Watkins Glen, New York. I believe if they did live their life out somewhere else that somebody would have recognized them eventually because this case was pretty popular in the 70s. As for the phone call that Mitchell's father received where the person claimed that their name was Bonnie and then they hung up, this reminds me a lot of the Polly Class case and what happened with Polly Class's father. Unfortunately, there are a lot of sick people in this world who think that doing something like this is hilarious. I don't understand it at all, but I think that this may have been a prank call as well. When it comes to this case, most people agree, and I'm sure most of you will as well, that it can be simplified as they hitchhiked and they just happened to hitchhike with the wrong person or people and something horrible happened. Just because it can most likely be simplified as that doesn't mean that the family doesn't deserve to know what happened to their children or know who was responsible or who were responsible and I think that's the main issue with this case. I mean there's so many cases especially in the 60s and 70s even up until today where people hitchhike and sometimes they hitchhike because they have no other way of getting anywhere. They don't have a car, they don't have money for the bus, they just decide to hitchhike and they hitchhike with the wrong person. That still doesn't mean that their loved ones don't deserve to know exactly what happened and I hope that one day their families can have closure because they went through complete Hell. I do not personally believe that Mitchell and Bonnie decided to just run away and leave their lives behind. This just doesn't seem like them from what I read about them. They had a lot of friends, they were very close to their families, and Bonnie had been worried about her father. I just do not think that they would up and leave and never return. I don't think that that was the mindset they were going into leaving for the festival. With. I don't think they were thinking of going to the festival and then just never going back home. Let me know your opinions though about this case. I try to read every single comment. I love communicating with you guys and seeing what theories you all come up with. And with that being said, I will see you all in my next video. Bye guys.